hello to everyone who's, who's maybe watching on, on YouTube or right now. Uh, this is the first time we're in Houston. Um, everyone, of course, has a pair of nice boots on under the table. The next slide, please, um, is our disclaimer. And of course, like always, I thank all the members of the team with Dr. Galandiak supervising us. Um, next slide. So, um, um, so Houston looks and sounds like a very vibrant city. And I kind of did a research thing that I do with every, uh, every city and I Google for fun facts. And the first thing that came up was that it is illegal to sell Limburger cheese on Sundays. And so I had to look up what Limburger cheese is. And um, it's apparently a semi-soft cheese from the French speaking Belgian province. And uh, the smell of which is caused by the Brevi bacterium linens bacteria which is the same bacteria which is responsible for BO. Um, and apparently, apparently this is linked to Houston, but not on Sunday. So um, uh, on this interesting note, I'd like to thank Dr. Eric Haas and his team for supporting our journal club. I will introduce Dr. Haas a bit more formally later as he is our special guest. Uh, but of course, he is a professor in the medical school of the University of Houston and the president and co-founder of Houston Colon. Um, and if I can have Dr. Haas to talk about his city, his institution, and his wonderful colleagues to start. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Vladi. So I'm going to turn over the introductions because we're all going to kind of take part a little bit with uh, Josh Corsi, who's our associate uh, chair here. And so he's going he's gonna to talk a little bit about uh, uh, our program in the city, and then, and then we, can go, we can go from there. Would that work? Fantastic. All right. Well, um, thanks everybody for being here tonight. Uh, we're obviously doing this live. Uh, this is uh, our new model for uh, doing this. This is our first time presenting this particular journal club, but uh, where this is part of our monthly educational conference that we do as part of our group. So um, we figured what better opportunity for all of us to get together and you stare at a bunch of pretty faces all at the same time instead of just a bunch of Zoom windows. Um, so uh, we are hailing from beautiful Houston, Texas, where the weather is atrocious today and everybody's late because of traffic. But um, Houston is a fifth, or excuse me, fourth largest city in the country, uh, believe it or not. It kind of flies under the radar, I think. I've lived here for 20 years now, and I can say that there are a lot of very good things about the place, but uh, it's, you know, kind of missing some of the pizzazz that maybe LA or New York or Chicago might have. But uh, we've got it where it counts. As you can see in the pictures there, we've got uh, NASA. Uh, Mission Control is down here as well as a lot of the facilities where they build a lot of the, um, the uh, they, part of the, they built part of the James Webb Space Telescope down here. Uh, there's a bunch of really cool old derelict spaceships that you can go visit if you go to Clear Lake, so highly recommended. Uh, we are home of the biggest uh, rodeo in the world here. Uh, it's held in February and it's a uh, not only a rodeo, but there's a bunch of concerts and uh, a bunch of rides and all sorts of cook-offs and fun food stuff that goes on as well. It's a big draw for uh, not only Houstonites or Houstonians, but from people from the surrounding area and all over the country. Um, we are home to the biggest medical center in the world, which you see on the uh, right-hand side, the upper right-hand side there. Uh, that is actually a picture, not of downtown, but of the Texas Medical Center, which is a conglomeration of a whole bunch of different hospitals. And you can actually see off in the distance on the right side of the picture, those little pickets out in the, the corner of the picture, that, that's downtown. So uh, the Texas Medical Center is home to over 100,000 employees and sees millions of patients every year inter internationally. Um, it's where a lot of us did all of our training, uh, myself and uh, Dr. Ellsworth included here, um, and have been very fortunate to train here because it's a great place to uh, both train and to, to learn and to practice. Um, of course, we are home of the Houston Astros, which you see down in the, uh, the center photo there, and uh, Houston Methodist Hospital, which is our primary hospital affiliation. Um, we were very proud to uh, be listed as number one in GI surgery for Texas and number eight for GI surgery for the entire country this year. So uh, it's a great place to practice. We saw a lot of really interesting uh, and varied patients uh, all over the spectrum, cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, you name it, we got it. Um, can, we get, can we go to the next slide, please? So um, these are going to be our lovely people who are going to be discussing tonight. Um, we have two of our advanced minimally invasive fellows tonight, Dr. Ellen Wicker and Dr. Deepa Patel. Uh, Dr. Wicker is with us currently, and Dr. Patel is on her way and stuck in traffic. 
Um, next, we have Dr. Ellsworth. Uh, Dr. Ellsworth has been a part of our practice for five, four or five years now. I think it's five. Yeah. Five. We'll go with five. We'll go with five. Five, five sounds like a good, good round number. Um, so she uh, she did her training in Houston and uh, has the, uh, the distinction of, of having trained with yours truly. She was actually the one who convinced me to do colorectal surgery. So that's a, that's a, a, a plus. That's me on the, uh, the top right there. Uh, during a very, very narrow period in which I did not have a beard. Um, that's the exception rather than the rule. I shaved it off to wear N95s during COVID and then promptly grew it back. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, to the wife's and everybody else's request. Um, bottom left, we have Dr. Jean-Paul Lafave, and uh, he is one of our illustrious colorectal surgeons who has been with us for a very long time working with Dr. Haas. It, um, then next we have uh, Dr. Matthew Weaver, who's been with us for about two years now, um, and Dr. Mark, Mark Edgecombe, who's going to be joining us remotely tonight. He is our most recent uh, uh, associate. Um, he was actually one of our advanced minimal invasive fellows last year. And then last but not least, the man, the myth, the legend, everybody's favorite to universal acclaim, Dr. Eric Haas. And we can go to the next slide. Oh, fantastic. So we, we always have a poll. Um, and so our poll for today, and, and we'll share, share this also on Twitter later, uh, is um, what do you find to be the biggest challenge in adopting a new operative technique or procedure? Um, so if we can have a couple of answers, and whilst that's running on the background, we'll go to our next slide, please. Our first paper is titled Intracorporeal Anastomosis and Minimally Invasive Bright Colectomies Are Associated with Fewer Incisional Hernias and Shorter Length of Stay. It is brought to us from the team in MSK. Um, Dr. Wicker will be kindly presenting the paper, and then Dr. Jean-Paul Lafave will be the moderating faculty. So thank you very much. Uh, please start when you're ready. Okay. Um, so hi there. My name's uh, Ellen Wicker. I'll be presenting this first paper. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit of background. So minimally invasive techniques are widely accepted by the colorectal community. Um, however, there's still debate as to the optimal approach. You'll see on the slide listed are the advantages and disadvantages of intracorporeal anastomosis for right hemicolectomy, as this is the one of the debated optimal approaches. Um, some of the advantages are going to be that the extraction site can be placed in an optimal site, which possibly leads to less incisional hernias, and there's possibly quicker return to bowel function and therefore shorter length of stay. The main disadvantage is the technical difficulty of performing the intracorporeal anastomosis. Most comparisons between the intra and extracorporeal anastomoses have focused on short-term outcomes. However, this study focuses on a long-term adverse outcome, which is incisional hernia rate. Next slide, please. So some of the methods here, this was a retrospective study. It was looking at patients that were all at the same facility with surgeries by the same exact surgeon from the years of 2013 to 2017. Patients were excluded if they had extraction sites other than a fan and steel for an intracorporeal anastomosis or a vertical midline for an extracorporeal anastomosis. Mechanical bowel prep and oral antibiotics were routinely used in both groups. And the decision to perform an intracorporeal versus an extracorporeal anastomosis was based on the availability of robotic staplers and adequate bedside assistance. Trocar placement and operative setup for all cases was uniform. All incisions greater than eight millimeters were closed with a running PDS suture and skin incisions were closed with Rio nylons. Primary outcome was a presence of incisional hernia as defined by the European Hernia Society guidelines, which includes hernias detected by either imaging and or physical exam. Next slide, please. So these are some of the tables from the results. If you look at table one, you can see there were a total of 164 patients. 67 in the intracorporeal group and 97 in the extracorporeal group. Please note that most of the differences in demographics of the two patient groups were not statistically significant. 
The only statistically significant difference between the two groups are the five patients on immunosuppression in the intracorporeal group. Table two shows a comparison of operative times, and you can see that the median operative time for the intracorporeal group was about 30 minutes longer, and this was statistically significant. The other significant finding noted in table two is the differences in incision lengths. The incision length was longer on average for the extracorporeal group than the intracorporeal group. The last table um, in the bottom right corner shows secondary outcomes such as 30-day mortality, surgical side infections, length of stay, and rates of readmission. The length of stay for the intracorporeal group is one day less than the extracorporeal group, and this is statistically significant. The other significant finding was the difference in superficial and deep incisional infections. There were nine for the intracorporeal group and only one for the extracorporeal group. Next slide. So this is more of the results that they found in the, in the study and just kind of going over how long they followed the patients as well. They followed them for a median of 14 months and 80% of the patients had at least one post-operative imaging study, an MRI or a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Overall, there were 18 total extraction site incisional hernias and two trocar site incisional hernias. All the extraction site incisional hernias were in the extracorporeal group and the trocar site hernias were all in the intracorporeal group. After analysis, extracorporeal anastomosis was significantly associated with incisional hernia with an estimated rate of 12% after one year compared to only 2% after one year for intracorporeal anastomosis. As seen in the tables before, there was no difference in rate of incisional hernias based on demographics like BMI, smoking, or age. Next slide, please. So the conclusions that the, the paper comes to um, is that performing an intracorporeal anastomosis with a fan and steel extraction site can reduce incisional hernia rates and potentially reduce length of stay after robotic right colectomies. They suggest that a randomized trial is needed to validate these results. Uh, thank you very much for such a succinct summary. Um, if, if we can get Dr. Lafave to weigh in uh, on his opinion on this study now, please. Great, thank you. Yes, um, found an interesting, interesting trial. Um, I think uh, the retrospective nature of it uh, has some questions and concerns that I may, I may rise, uh, arise with, with the discussion. But otherwise, you know, having one surgeon and the, the ability to perform uh, the same procedure essentially over the, the span of four years I think does have some validity in terms of technique. And I guess we'll, we'll have a discussion regarding techniques as well, if I could bring that up. Um, the, there are some interesting findings, I thought, uh, that, that do uh, bar some deeper discussion, including surgical site infections. Uh, I, think, I think that was one of the interesting things. And, and I do have some questions about that as well. Um, and then also the, um, uh, the hernia rates. Uh, barring as this was a... Um, uh, a trial looking at hernias in terms of the long term, uh, and, and in a population such as um, such as cancer patients, I found it interesting that um, only 80%. Uh, there might be some fallout there, and, and maybe maybe um, you know lost to follow up. But 80% uh, of patients only un underwent uh, imaging studies afterwards, uh, uh, which which might be something beneficial for for people to look at in terms of how many actually true symptomatic versus asymptomatic hernias uh, may be found in the post-operative period. Now just uh, maybe ask a few questions to the panel and see if there's any discussion that we can we can drum up from that. I'd, I'd like to take that next step. Great, thank you. Sure, I, I guess for the panel, um, in terms of skin incision, do you, would anybody consider a skin incision different than a fascial incision? And, and if so, what, what would you say? Would your fascial incisions typically be much larger, about the same, in terms of your uh, surgical technique for, say, an extracorporeal or even the fin and steel incision? Rachel, you want to start? Sure. I think for fin and steel incisions, which would be mostly mine are about the same. My skin incision, my fascial incision are the same. I think when it, we were doing extracorporeal anastomosis, it seems that some, at times, we might cheat a little bit on the fascia and that might actually end up being a little bit bigger than the skin incision because we'd stretch the skin a little bit. Um, 
And I think maybe we saw more hernias after that. Um, but I think as of late, most of us are doing fan and steel incisions for that reason is to reduce the risk of postoperative hernia. Josh? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. The, the first thing that came to mind when <clears throat> you posed the question was back in the days when we were doing these uh, surgeries via uh, single incision using the gel point platform. Um, you know, the common approach was to do these rights through a peri umbilical incision, and you could cheat into the belly button uh, to make the incision uh, and actually detach the umbilical stock and so you have this, this beautiful, you know, tiny little, you know, two centimeter incision that you can see externally. And then underneath you have this big whopping fascial incision in order to be able to extort, extra corporealize because you do get you know, a fair amount of stretch on the skin. Um, and so, yeah, with those patients, um, I had, uh, you know, not a huge number, but um, a not insignificant number of post-operative uh, incisional site hernias. But with the advent of doing these via fan and steel, I mean, knock on wood, I've never had an incisional hernia since there. And there is, you know, parity between the size of the, the uh, fascial incision and the skin incision. There's basically a one in one relationship between the two. Um, to this effect, um, the, the authors mentioned in the methods that the fascial incisions uh, of any, any fascial incision greater than eight millimeters was closed with a running PDS suture. Um, and they identified that they had two troca um, hernias. Now, do, do you um, think symptomatic port side hernias can occur in upper quadrant ports? Uh, so in terms of worrying where the hernias are, do, do you uh, differentiate on which, um, which uh, port site it is? And does that affect where you place the port sites, particularly for robotic cases? Sure, I, I, I can start with that one. I guess for our, for our technique in terms of intracorporeal right colectomies, we've, we've really gotten away from the midline uh, for any ports. And I think that uh, bears fruit with, with their study as well. It seems like near the midline, you're, you're likely to get a higher uh, hernia rate. Um, in terms of fascial closures, I would say a clean, a clean incision through the fascia of an eight, typically I, I, I wouldn't close that. However, um, and, and I think this was mentioned in, in their study as well, but a higher BMI, I feel like the the robot really puts a lot of torque on the abdominal wall, and, and if you look at the if you look at the uh, uh, peritoneum or fascia uh, when you're close when you're removing the ports, I feel like a, an eight turns easily into a twelve or even a fifteen uh, within the abdomen. So I, you know if 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 center of the robot trocar is within the fascia, then I would say that <clears throat> and there's a clean cut. I would say that probably a, a closure is not recommended or needed, but um, anything larger or stress on that abdominal wall, I would I would recommend a closure. Yeah, we have seen, we have seen a, um, we rarely close our eight millimeter robotic ports, but we, ha we I have seen a hernia on an eight millimeter robotic port once. And I think because the, the robotic device can be very traumatic, if the port starts to become loose or if you're kind of operating against the direction of the port, there can be situations where the, the size left from that eight millimeter effectively is much larger. So I, I don't think Eights are recommended to routinely close, but you can have a hernia from an eight, just to keep that in mind. Twelves for sure need to be closed. You, you will definitely get hernias from the 12 millimeter port sites um, if they're not closed. Yeah, and one, one, uh, one point of, uh, regarding the 12 millimeters is that for the rights, uh, you know, we put the, the, the we make the fan and steel incision and put a gel point device through fan and steel site. And then the 12 is actually our camera port and so you have to camera hop when you do your stapling, but it does avoid having to put the 12 millimeter port in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. So that's one less thing that you have to close at the end of the surgery. But and the point is well taken, and especially when you're looking at the end of the procedure and you're removing your ports, your um, left lower quadrant port, where you're going to be doing the business end of your dissection, uh, especially if it's a larger patient, you really do have to pay attention to how long, you know, how large the fascial opening is or how much the peritoneum has been disrupted during that, which can be sort of an indirect marker, and you know, kind of how much play that trocar has to help to make it you know, guide your decision if that really does need to have a car Thomas and pass through it. Thank you for that. Um, I've, my next question um, is sort of the um, the technical aspects related to the intracorporeal anastomosis. Now, I, I personally am very pleased that the study didn't go into what I think is an erroneous track of comparing the quality of an intracorporeal versus an extracorporeal anastomosis. And, and, and the money really is in the extraction site for me uh, with this technique. 
but when you do an intracorporeal anastomosis, um, do you mobilize the same amount of bowel or do you mobilize less? And do you think there are benefits or, or, or risks related to that? So, that, so I think we mobilize less. I mean, because I think you have to effectively you mobilize less of the transverse colon to create your anastomosis. So I, I mean, I think that's been the trend for all of us. And I, I don't think that that's associated with any type of risk. I think you're really, it ends up decreasing the operative time sometimes because you're not mobilizing as much momentum off the transverse colon and, and taking that side down. Whereas when we used to do extracorporeal anastomosis, I remember mobilizing the transverse colon all the way, at least to the falciform, if not more, in order to get to reach through the abdominal wall. And so um, I think it's been associated with probably less complication, shorter operative times. And, and I don't think we have any difficulty in creating the anastomosis, the lay of the anastomosis um, within the body. Great. Uh, that, that makes perfect sense to me, particularly with an obese patient with a big abdominal wall. Now, in terms of the anastomosis itself, um, is the anastomosis you prefer for an intracorporeal ultimately the same as you would for an open or an extracorporeal, or do you, uh, or, or do you have a different anastomosis for a different uh, uh, surgical approach? Yeah, we've changed. We we've changed our approach entirely um, since we went uh, intracorporeal a few years ago. We do probably ninety percent of our procedures intracorporeal and isoperistaltic, and, and we've definitely changed from. What, we, what I think is, is not a great technique, which is a double staple, you know, especially in Dr. Glandick will know, especially, you know, IBD patients, it tends to get boggy and blown up. And, uh, but I really love the uh, isoperistaltic intracorporeal. I think our whole group pretty much went towards that pathway independently without even discussing amongst ourselves. And we really like that uh, anatomy. You save a lot of real estate, like you're talking about, like Dr. Ellsworth was saying. Uh, you don't have to go up the transverse colon if you don't need to. Um, if it's a non-anatomical or let's say uh, non-oncologic resection, you can, you can save all that real estate in there by just taking exactly what you need and getting right to it. So I, I think we've gravitated towards that pretty much entirely, as most, most have who are doing this minimally invasive. Thank you. Um, the, the next question I have, um, uh, to start with as an observation, the authors note that there was a significant association between intracorporeal anastomosis and, and an increased rate of superficial and deep incisional um, surgical site infections, which I found very surprising. Um, so 9% versus 1% with a significant um, sort of statistical p-value. Um, do you think this is due to the intraperitoneal enterotomy and colotomy where you have the bowel sort of open? Um, is it affected by bowel prepping patients? Um, and do you have any techniques to ameliorate that risk such as, you know, irrigation, suction, post-operative antibiotics? I think we all found that pretty surprising, um, especially with the fan and steel. It seems like it's away from the, uh, the, the area of, of anastomosis, but uh, that's, uh, oh, actually those are questions I had as well in terms of whether the technique, it looks like there was an assistant port used, whether a, a suction was readily available for the enterotomies that were created. Uh, it looks like all patients were bowel prepped at that time. Um, the the intercorporeal nature, um, or, or I'm sorry, all, all, all extractions were using a wound protector, but um, it, does, it does bear to question whether an intercorporeal anastomosis with spillage of bowel contents put those wounds for a higher risk. There are some techniques that we do use when we staple through the uh, abdominal wall that that may, may benefit someone in, in fact, uh, using the stapler, we, we tend to have the, the tech clean the stapler uh, in between usages, especially if it goes uh, intraluminally. Um, and and when, when that's done, um, we seem to stay more sterile, if you will. Also, the question of I had whether a, a closing table or a sterile technique was utilized during the, the closure of, of, the, of the procedure sometimes, uh, especially with extracorporeal anastomosis, we will, we will change gloves and keep instruments uh, clean versus quote unquote dirty. So um, it, it was a, an interesting finding I thought as well in terms of the intracorporeal na nature. Thank you. My last question, unless there's anything in the chat from the audience is, um, is a scenario where a patient has a known ventral hernia and particularly with the 
results of this study with an intracorporeal anastomosis having a slightly higher infection rate. If you have a patient with a known hernia, would you still do an intracorporeal or would you do an extracorporeal anastomosis and fix the hernia at the same time? Yeah, I, 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 wrote that, I wrote that same question uh, on my paper for the uh, panel, but, but I would say I, we have run into situations where we've seen a hernia and it, a large enough hernia and, and you see this wad of momentum stuck into it and you know, you're thinking you're doing a great thing by removing that momentum from the hernia defect and, and if without closing that hernia, we've, we've seen a couple of obstructions come back uh, from, from that. So um, if, if, if there's a hernia there in the midline and, and that's an extraction port, I think you're going to get the benefits of an intracorporeal, but you're also going to do them a favor by closing the hernia. Now, utilization of mesh, I think we could have another whole discussion regarding that. And that, that was another question I had for the panel. If, if anybody thought if, if this study were able to to differentiate hernia patients and their high risk natures, would, would a 12% hernia rate um, benefit, would, would it be beneficial to put a prophylactic mesh in somebody? Um, I don't think anybody has a great answer for that in terms of right colectomies either, but um, I would say intracorporeal is probably gonna benefit the patient in terms of post-operative care and the extraction site. You're gonna put them at risk for a hernia that they already have and, and probably in the future, they'll need a definitive repair anyway. So uh, I say try and fix the hernia at that time if you can. Yeah, Thank you. I want to just mention because we've had a couple of pretty devastating cases over the years where there's there's a hernia during your surgery. You have to reduce the contents to get to the bowel, and you leave that alone, saying, "You know what? I, this is a contaminated case or clean contaminated." And we've had a couple of early post-op obstructions that were not our fault. It's not our hernia, but it becomes your hernia. And massive. This one case, just dead small bowel, just got into there two weeks after surgery. It becomes becomes your your complication. So uh, I've learned my lesson from that one. Yeah, if, if if you if the hernia is all stuck with bowel anyway, leave it alone. But if you have to reduce it and you're in a minimally invasive environment, you do your anastomosis. You you got to have to kind of consider that they can get an early post op uh, incarceration if you don't address it. So it's a judgment call, but you, you need to weigh that in. Thank you. Um, uh, th I think those are fantastic points. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the next paper, please. Um, and so our second paper comes from the team in Stanford. Um, and, and we may be fortunate enough to have uh, the couple of authors on the call. At least they, we communicated with them. I'm not sure if, if they are available. If they are, uh, perhaps they can raise a hand and we can get them to participate. Anyway, um, the paper title is Oncologic and Perioperative Outcomes of Laparoscopic Open and Robotic Approaches for Rectal Cancer Resection, a Multicenter Propensity Score Weighted uh, Cohort Study. Um, uh, Dr. Deepa Patel will be presenting and Dr. Rachel Ellsworth will be the moderating faculty. Thank you very much. Start when you're ready. So thank you for the opportunity to present. This paper published by Dr. Kins Group at Stanford the rates of successful oncologic reception and post-operative outcomes of laparoscopic open and robotic approaches are evaluated using the NISCOP database. The authors performed this review due to the conflicting results of meta-analyses of existing RCTs comparing oncologic reception rates and post-operative outcomes between open, robotic, and laparoscopic low interior resections. This was an observational cohort study using the NISCOP data set and propensity score weighting. All adult patients undergoing resection for rectal cancer in 2016 were included. The primary outcome was successful oncologic resection defined as negative distal and radial margins with over or with at least 12 lymph nodes evaluated. Secondary outcomes were systemic and surgical site complications, readmission, reoperation, operative time, and length of stay. We can go on to the next slide. And the authors utilized propensity score weighting in an effort to minimize selection bias in a non-randomized study. Propensity score weighting is a statistical technique that is applied in order to best simulate an RCT. This slide shows the variables included in this model, which were age, BMI, sex, tobacco use, history of COPD, presence of diabetes, dyspnea, ascites, or bleeding disorder, dialysis dependence, steroid use, weight loss of over 10% in the prior six months, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, rectal tumor location, and pre-op tumor stage. We can go on to the next slide. And the study results are shown here. So in the upper right-hand corner, as the pie chart shows, there were approximately 1,000 rectal cancer resections. 
20% um, of which were laparoscopic, roughly 20% of which were robotic, and 60% were performed open. After propensity score weighting, there were no significant sociodemographic or pre-op clinical differences between these cohorts. The table in the upper left shows the primary outcome of the study. The oncologic success rate among lap cases was 77%. Open and robotic approaches had only 0.6 times the chance of having a successful oncologic resection when compared with the LAP approach. In addition, it shows one of the secondary outcomes defined as hospital length of stay. The open approach was generally associated with a two-day longer hospitalization. Overall, the open approach was 1.6 times as likely as the LAP approach to involve surgical site complications. Patients undergoing robotic surgery were two times as likely to be readmitted versus patients undergoing LAP cases. Um, Dr. Ellsworth will lead the discussion. Thank you very much. The conclusions. Doing a job oh, to the last. Sure. Let's just go ahead and do the conclusions of the paper, and then we'll we'll swing back to the discussion. Go ahead. Should finish your just... um, um, Next slide, please. Go to the conclusions. Thank you. Um, in conclusion, according to this review, and despite some limitations, lap resections were actually the most likely to achieve oncologic success. Laparoscopic and robotic approaches were associated with reduced surgical site complications and decreased post-op length of stay. They were also not associated with longer operative times versus open resection. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, now, uh, Dr. Ellsworth, um, can we get a few of your comments, please? Of course. So, you know, I commend the authors on, on trying to approach this question. It's been looked at in a lot of different studies about what is the best technique? How can you achieve the best oncologic outcomes? I think there are some limitations. I think the utilization of the propensity score weighting is important in this study because, you know, this is essentially, this is a retrospective review from a database um, across many institutions. And I think they selected nice sort of items to look at in the propensity score weighting because it really looks at preoperative chemotherapy, the location of the tumor, things that are very important in trying to eliminate selection bias as well as patient factors as well. And so I think that that was important to include when you're doing this type of study. I think the major limitation though is you, they're not accounting for surgeon volume because that's not one of the NISQIP data points that is extracted um, or institutional volume with robotics. And so I think that that really can skew the results. And I'm not sure that in addition, you know, they don't have any data on the specimens themselves and TM, like what is the TME status of these specimens it's not really part of the site. So it's difficult to draw a conclusion about oncologic success. And so my thought when reading this study was, well, this is a multi-institutional study. Um, a lot of different surgeons are performing these techniques and, and may or may not have different experiences with this. It's looked at over one year period of time. And I think the NISQIP database is wonderful, but, you, but these variables are being extracted. So there is a little bit of inter-extractor variability with, with these things. And so I, I think our experience with what their conclusions were is very different in our practice as far as what our oncologic outcomes are with using robotic techniques and, and specifically with visualization. I think everybody in the group would agree that we have, we feel that we have a better visualization of the pelvis, that we are able to successfully treat lower rectal cancers using the robotic technique. Um, the one thing that I couldn't really tell from reading the study is, well, what was everybody using the same type of robot? Was this an XI or are any institutions are using SI? I didn't see that included in the details. So, and I think that can really affect your success with robotics as well. Um, so, so we noted their conclusions, but I think there are certain limitations just because the nature of the study, you know, it, it is a retro, retrospective study um, and it's multi-institutions, and there's a lot of variability between surgeon experience. Um, so with that, I sort of talk, turn it over to our panel and our experience with robotics and rectal cancer. And, and Vladi, you, you're, you may ask this question, I don't want to steal your thunder, but what about the open and the open assist? And that was kind of the real question mark for me. Um, I don't even know what an open assist is, but I know our NISQIP, we're NISQIP, uh, hospital and, and and we follow our data with them 
And a lot of times they'll even make our cases open that with well, a minute we say we extend our incision, they see the word incision. I've had to go back and say, no, you basically have to make some incision typically to take the specimen out. Sometimes they call those open, open assisted. Um, the study is a really well done study uh, and it's very informative, but it's a little counter intuitive that how can um, laparoscopic be better than even open where you've got it all in front of you. Um, and so when, when, we, when I saw that the colostomy rate, and correct me if I'm wrong, was like 50% or 55% in this study, wasn't there a very high colostomy rate or something like that? Yeah. Um, so I'm saying, well, we're now getting to maybe the more difficult cases, the more, uh, you know, and they select out, the more difficult cases are done open. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. Um, so that's kind of my brief comments, but I want to hear your questions and some of the other panelists' thoughts. Thank you. Uh, th those are very interesting points. Um, I, I think partly you're going to be responsible for even more confusion because given that you now do intracorporeal anastomoses, now if I do an extracorporeal, does that mean I'm doing an open case where everything else is done minimally invasively? So it's going to be even worse soon, I suspect. Um, but I'm going to take up the point about the surgeon or institutional volume, which Rachel mentioned about. Um, now, every study on robotics, it has a rite of passage to say that there's a learning curve. Um, and, and my question is, you know, robotics have been around for a considerable amount of time now. When you look at robotics paper, papers, do you have a cutoff where you say after a certain day, you know, it's no longer a learning curve, it's now an integrated technique. And the con of that is before that, you know, maybe, you know, early 2000s or, or early, you know, teens, before that, you sort of go, well, that's really, you know, it hasn't been mainstream yet. And so therefore, the, the data would be meaningless. Sorry, we're taking a pause for the big <laughs> fat onion ring. <laughs> That's, requested that's another, specifically. That's another um, tradition. Are they big fat? <laughs> Two things about Texas Journal Clubs. There's going to be tequila, which we're trying to keep a little under the radar in respect to the academic environment, but also big fat onion rings. There's just no other way to go about it. And that's just a tradition. And it's our fellows first journal club. So they're kind of being introduced and acclimated. So that's a quick time out, but we'll, we'll get back onto the uh, I understand. When I returned back to Australia, I remember coming to a supermarket and all of a sudden everything was like miniature. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in Texas. I was in Ohio. So I'm sure these um, onion rings would be enormous if I was actually standing next to one. <laughs> okay, so. but, but back to the point, and in terms of the, um, the robotics, is there a cutoff where you think that you know, it's now part of clinical practice and there is no longer an excuse for a learning curve. And the con of that is if it's before a certain, you know, date in a study where you can't really say that it's part of clinical practice and, and, and the data there is, is genuinely, you know, not translatable. Uh, <clears throat> at least from my experience and, and through the training experience, I think, I think everybody comes from a different place in terms of their robotic experience and their quote unquote learning curves. I think everybody has their certificate. Everybody has their modules done. Everybody has their dry labs done. Um, but I, I think it really boils down to uh, your experience, your, your overall training in, in terms of where you trained, what, it, what exposure you had there, and then what kind of surgeries were, were performed. I, I think, um, you know, if, if, if you had some people coming out of uh, a minimally invasive background um, as, a pro, as, a, as opposed to an open background for colectomies, I, I think you're going to see drastic results in terms of quote unquote the learning curve, um, just, just the, the exposure that you'll, that you'll get. So I, I would agree, I, I, don't, I don't really take much in terms of the learning curves. I, I think, I think the, the numbers of procedures performed um, tease that out a little bit. I, th I think that also uh, will affect the, uh, the surgeon's utilization of the robot too. So, so I think if, if you see somebody that does a few robotics here and there, but the majority is open procedures, I, I feel like there's always kind of a bias towards that. So uh, I, I don't think anybody has a great answer as to how, how many rectal cancers you can perform before you feel comfortable. I, I feel like some people come out and feel pretty comfortable right away. 
think that thank you so important as well because i you know if you look at the patient factors a lot of the bmis that they had um were you know 27 i think was sort of the average um but a lot of times the bmis that we see are higher over 30 and so you know i think that that you know i think the more you do the more comfortable you are with that but again i mean that's a very sometimes patient factors are difficult to overcome when you have this technique in your whatever the technique is if you're adopting a new technique or you're working that into your practice it takes a while to become comfortable when you're trying to overcome certain factors which is why i think you know it was meaningful that they did this type of score weighting to look at everything um but i think especially in rectal cancer bmi you know, preoperative chemotherapy, you know, chemo radiation, all of those play a factor in your success. Um, and also sort of the um, location of the tumor as well, about what you're able to successfully complete comfortably. That's just been, I think, experience that all of us have shared with robotics. Yeah, I think. Thank, thank you for that. Um, we're going to, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say uh, that uh, the, Selection, at least for, for me, you know, I started out my practice laparoscopically, and then the factors for deciding whether to do cases robotically may have been based on um, something that I thought was easier, quote unquote, to approach robotically. Uh, but I may have been earlier in my learning curve in terms of being like, well, I have more dexterity with the robot, better visualization, but maybe a little bit less familiarity with the uh, platform, and then also attacking something that is potentially a more difficult tumor deeper in the pelvis larger tumor, local invasion, so on and so forth. And so I think there's a lot of factors that determine why somebody would approach something robotically that, that kind of fly under the radar. And then also, you know, knowing what the split between robotics versus laparoscopic versus open in terms of somebody's clinical practice is, um, is also important because the fact that, you know, I can tell you that my outcomes for robotic procedures are markedly better since adopting that as my sole surgical practice. I don't do laparoscopic surgery unless I have to do laparoscopic surgery. If I have a robot available, I do robotic surgery. And so, you know, the laparoscopy open surgery is done more out of a matter of necessity than it is as a, a primary modality. And I think that, you know, that, that was kind of part of, you know, what we have adopted as a group was that it was really kind of an all or nothing. Like we do robotic surgery or we don't do robotic surgery. And, we all kind of bought in and that's, that, that is our chosen modality for surgery. And I think the outcomes are commensurate to that. Thank you. Uh, that was actually one of my other questions um, about the bi sort of um, non-divide in terms of all or none for robotic surgery, particularly in countries, say like Australia, where you we don't have as much access to robotics. But knowing that we're a little bit over time, because I do want to get to Dr. Haas's special guest segment, um, let's reveal the, um, the, the poll results. And in terms of this, and sort of having a segue into new technology, I would be interested to see um, if, if you, uh, particularly to Dr. Haas, if you, if you talk to um, to people about the NICE procedure, and they give you one of these responses. What is your response to that? How, how do you convince them to, to try something new? And does it, is it necessary to do so? Yes, I mean, it's, it's interesting because we, as in this room, have a lot of teaching and mentorship going on, which I think is one of the, one of the most uh, exciting parts of our group and our practice and, and many out there. And so, you know, when we get our fellows or, or young residents, et cetera, come on board and they're doing something and I, and I say inevitably, why are you doing it that way? And the answer is, this is the way I was trained. That's exactly, that's my opportunity to say, well, if I did things the way I was trained and if others did way the things they were trained, we wouldn't be where we were today. So that's, that's your baseline. That's your, that's your bill of goods, but you've got to continue to take your experiences each and every day and see if you can offer uh, improved options, better techniques, alternatives. And, uh, and as you, as you, as you go through that, you're going to, you're going to understand that, Hey, as, as time goes on, as new technologies evolve, you're going to be able to, to um, leverage your, your training with newer technologies and put it all together and offer, offer some opportunities for your patients to do better. Right. Um, 
so just so we will give uh, give Stephen an opportunity to summarize the results so that they're they'll be recorded on the YouTube channel and then proceed I'll to the share next step. once more. So uh, yeah, the majority did want as four out of the 10 that responded to have better data before they would commit to a new procedure. Although um, among the people that were not excited to, uh, to be first starters, there were also two responders who thought that it was too much time expanded to, to evolve to a new procedure and then Another responder was worried that the standard of their procedures, or the standard of care that they give to their patients would be hurt by trying new procedures. Um, thank you for that. So now let's move on to the next slide. Um, now, as you can see um, in the, um, yes, there it is. As you can see, Dr. Haas is, has an extensive list of achievements but I think the, undoubtedly the biggest of which is that he is a father of five, according to one of the websites I have, I have looked at. Um, now, uh, Dr. Haas chairs and serves on a number of committees, particularly in the areas of education, robotic innovation and new technologies, both through ASCARS and the Fellowship Council. Um, and I was fortunate to approach him via Twitter. Um, and I will shamelessly plug the DCR Twitter account where we routinely share uh, educational and free content. Um, so Dr. Haas responded very promptly and I'm incredibly grateful that he embraced this journal club and I'm very jealous also of the onion rings. Um, <laughs> um, I would like to focus our discussion on the NICE procedure um, and uh, Dr. Haas has prepared some videos that we will play shortly but before that just a few um, sort of introductory questions. Uh, so firstly how did you take on robotic surgery and particularly what inspired you to become an innovator? Well, robotic surgery was, it was really at, uh, gosh, I can't remember the year. It was years ago, but it was at a, it was at a national meeting or society meeting. And I was, I was, uh, seeing some, uh, I was watching a podium like many of you out there and, and the room was packed and I saw this thing called robotic surgery and I was just mesmerized by what they were doing. This was back with the old SI model. And so, you know, I was young in my career, maybe five or six years into my practice. And I looked at uh, what they were doing with this robotic technology. It was very rudimentary, but I said, this is the future. I mean, this has got to be the future. How can it not be? So I just basically, from that podium presentation, being all the way in the back of a standing room audience, I, I made a commitment that I, I, was, I was gonna grab onto this technology and, and see if we could, if I could bring it into my practice. It was that simple. Um, th thank you. And do you think in terms of introducing it into your practice, what is the difference in someone who's primarily an open surgeon versus someone who is proficient in laparoscopic pelvic surgery? Um, and how, how, where were you? And, and, and it seems to me sometimes if you can drive a manual car, it's very hard to you know, pick up an automatic. Yes, I mean, the interesting thing, Lenny, is that um, you can go from open to robotic, right? much easier than open to laparoscopic. I really do believe that. But the problem is, the problem, that's the solution. The problem is we do laparoscopic surgery in our practice for complications. So I think, you know, if you really want to be the all-around best surgeon you could be, if you just jump to robotic and you really don't learn how to do laparoscopic well, you're going to you're going to be faced with the most difficult, you know, those bowel obstructions or leaks or perforated colonoscopy. And that's when we pull out our laparoscopic skills. You may not have the robot at midnight or the weekend. And I find that our laparoscopic surgery is so challenging. The best way to do it, I think, is to be, become great at laparoscopic and also robotic simultaneously. But I think you can go from open to robotic probably quicker than from open to laparoscopic. Thank you. Um, the next uh, question, I guess, for you specifically, at what point in your learning curve did you feel it was appropriate to start developing new techniques? And what tips would you have for other surgeons, particularly early on in their careers? I mean, I think early on, and maybe this was mentioned here, is, is repetition is, is key. Just doing, be, do, developing in your mind a stepwise approach to your procedure you should, you know, we talk about, you should debrief, you, you should brief yourself before the procedure. You should map it out in your mind. And 
understand the steps and the accomplishments of the procedure. That's how we teach. But, you know, and if you're failing to progress, you should do something more comfortable and quicker and give it a shot the next time. I think reproducibility is the absolute key. And as you reproduce and reproduce, you will become an expert pretty quickly. Now, at that level, when you're really, the procedures become like the back of your hand, that's when you start to think outside the box and start to innovate, start to use all of the, all of your teachings and, and experiences to kind of pull it together. Thank you. And I guess now let's start focusing on the NICE procedure. Uh, what were the steps from conception uh, to performing, you know, a first clinical case and now to performing it routinely? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you know, the NICE procedure, you know, re using the rectum as a natural orifice to, to not only take out the specimen, but also to achieve the anastomosis. It's a funny, I mean, interesting story. And that's how keep, keep the memories in your mind, I guess, is one of my take home messages. I went and saw Morris Franklin, uh, who was in, uh, you know, three hours down the road in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and, a, and a rep wanted me to look at a new stapler. And I just fortuitously, 15 years ago, saw him do an intracorporeal extraction and, and anastomosis. And it was laparoscopic, and he was a great innovator, but I was nowhere near had the skill, ability, or, you know, what do you call courage to start doing procedures like that, you know, six, seven years in my career. But somehow it stayed in my head, suppressed subconsciously. And as we started doing more and more things robotically, just literally one day, I said, wait, I think we could just cut the rectum, take the specimen out. I remember seeing Dr. Franklin do it literally 15 years prior. And somehow I had some keys to the steps and we just, we just literally just did it one day. And it was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is incredible. We filmed it. We actually recorded that, tweeted it out, put it on LinkedIn and had like 30,000 views and comments. And everyone's like, what in the world is this? And we're like, we don't know, but it was, it was kind of cool. You know, we thought, we thought it did the patient some good. Um, and from then we, we literally huddled up our team, those in this room huddled up and we said, guys, we, we think we could develop a program. We have to see if it's safe and start getting an IRB together and, 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 you know, follow our patients. And we did all that. And so that's kind of how it all started. I, I think that is great marrying in the surgical history, which I think is undervalued and, um, and, and not emphasized as being important enough and, and, and sort of new innovation. That's a fantastic story. Now, maybe at this point we'll be fortunate enough to uh, to play your videos and you can talk us through them. I think they're ready whenever you are. Sure, uh, I'm ready. So these are a couple of papers we've actually published. So for those of you who want to go to DCR Journal and, and look at the video, these video publications, but uh, many different ways to put your ports. We use three eight millimeter robotic ports. Now this is benign disease. Um, and I think, it, I think we have some uh, delays with the with the zoom but essentially what you're seeing there 21 set 21 minutes 22 minutes that's the ticker to see how long these cases actually take and but a couple of important things using natural orifice for benign disease we like to take down the lateral reflection and that's the anterior reflection that kind of straightens out the rectum so we do that pretty much for all of our cases not just malignant for benign um, and essentially for the benign cases, we no longer do the retroperitoneal dissection, the, the ureter identification. We basically stay out of harm's way. So we divide proximally um, on the left colon, between the left colon and the sigmoid. Then we do a mesenteric sparing dissection that we saw there. And we just basically go to the rectum, which has been pulled up because we released all those attachments. Um, and for diverticular disease, you know, you want to get down to the rectum. And then we basically just cut distally and we just cut, we just divide open. Um, many different ways uh, to put in this retractor, which helps with extraction. We use a small Alexis uh, retractor, uh, kind of thread it through the, the valves of the rectum. There's a, some tips and tricks. That's probably a whole nother journal club. Uh, and when you see within 45 minutes or 50 minutes of the surgery, we have divided the specimen and we are just ready to bring it out the rectum. Um, again, I think the Alexis helps prevent inadvertent tearing, inadvertent injury. Sometimes the specimens are very bulky, and if it's benign, we'll actually shave the mesentery off. 100% need to make sure it's benign. Um, and to move the Alexis, 
we basically grab the rim and uh, steadily invert and it pops right out. Uh, and then many different ways to do the anastomosis. So that's however you like it. it we don't do hand sewn a lot, but this was one of our publications. So I wanted to show it, but basically we just do a, a baseball suture in this particular case um, uh, to, to do a hand sewn. And we're, we're looking at the timestamp within an hour, hour, 20 minutes, hour, 30 minutes, this kind of chronic recurrent diverticulitis, non-complicated, um, was completed. And that's one of, we think, the advantages that we're not making an incision, we're not uh, undocking the robot and then redocking the robot. These procedures just go very steadily uh, in a stepwise fashion. And, and here you see these four incisions there and the patients recover like those incisions look. I mean, they recover extremely, extremely well. And the other interesting thing about the recovery is it's, it's very, it's very um, reproducible, it's very predictable. When, when the surgery goes well like that, you know they're pretty much going home. We're not into the same day surgery, another topic, number, another journal club, but I like to keep our patients overnight a day or two. You know, For me having five kids, I know what it's like going home. Uh, so sometimes we like to say, stay in the hospital, relax, you just had big surgery. But anyway, they do really well and, and that's basically the, the incision <clears throat> afterwards. Oh, I guess, Vladi, we'll go on to the next one real quick, if we have time. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's two more short videos. Okay, yeah, these are short videos. So this was a more complicated diverticulitis with a colo, uh, with a enterocolic uh, fistula right into the diverticulitis. And this is, this is a, another publication in DCR. This was not necessarily planned. This is an example of just using your skills, pushing the limits as long as it's safe for the patient. Uh, but we, we found this fistula, there was some preoperative indicators that there was, might be a, a fistula non-Crohn's patient, it was diverticulitis. So we do the same thing. We, we released the small bowel fistula, kind of left it. Uh, we transected proximal and distal to disease. This is showing that we have a nice back table. So everything's there, everything's ready. It's kind of a part of our setup now. And once we divided through the rectal cuff, um, we also like to kind of dilate the rectum a little bit to make sure we're not, you know, I'd like a controlled dilation versus, you know, rupture. So we dilate there. We introduce the, another Alexis retractor um, in, in kind of a, a pull push technique there. We kind of expand the retractor. So in this particular case, um, we had a small bowel anastomosis that we had to do, but we have uh, access through the rectum. So really as we're doing the case, um, there we are pulling out the specimen. Uh, it gets a little thick there, but, but it comes out you know, very nicely. As we're doing the case, this is, was one of our first cases where we did an intracorporeal small bowel anastomosis you know, right through the rectum. So we have the small bowel there that, there, that was where we took down the fistula and we took down the mesentery, which we didn't show here, but it's, but it's gonna be on the, uh, it's in DCR if you wanna see the whole video. This is just an edited portion and we do kind of a double staple uh, technique for the small bowel anastomosis. And again, we keep it all intracorporeal, all minimally invasive. There's the uh, little piece there. And then we go on to do our intracorporeal uh, colorectal anastomosis. This is how we do probably 80 to 90% of our intracorporeal left-sided anastomosis. We basically use a V-lock. It does really well, just kind of an in and out purse string around the left colon. We introduce the, the anvil right there. And I really like this uh, little extra. We, we bring in an endo loop. And this is kind of what I remember Dr. Franklin doing the endo loop. And you just really secure it there. And then you go down to the rectal cuff. Here you can staple it or you can do a purse string. We, we've removed the stapler for two reasons. Number one, it's expensive. And number two, I don't like the crossing staple line. So we often just do two purse strings and we do a nice end to end we actually have a cost study coming out, which shows that by doing it this way and not using all those linear staplers, our costs are lower than open, lower than laparoscopic, and that makes a lot of sense. So we do, that's how we typically do our um, anastomosis, uh, you know, using a, using a uh, two purse strings for the end-to-end -end anastomosis. Last video real quick, I think this is the shortest video. This is just showing a couple of the differences when we have malignancy. Um, it's very important that we, we follow all of the oncologic, no touch, 
retroperitoneal techniques. So it's very different when we do it for benign disease where we're just pragmatic, just taking the disease out. When it's malignant, uh, we're just showing a few seconds here that we you know, skeletonize the feeding vessel, we sweep up all the lymph nodes, et cetera, et cetera. But also in malignant cases, we don't wanna have all those open lumens. You know, that's probably violating some of the principles of oncologic resection so some of the key features when it's malignant disease and we're going to use the rectum is we double staple. So we're not going to just cut open and have lumen everywhere. Not only do we double staple, but once we double staple, you then have to take the rectal staple line off to get transrectal access. So there's kind of a little extra step. If the specimen is large and bulky, we don't even do this. We just make our regular fanny incision. But if it's smaller and we think we can get it out, we put an alexis, and here I call the bag, the double bag technique. Not only do we have an alexis, but we put an endo bag because just in case it ruptures on the way out or something like that, you know, it's it, you just cannot have any chances when it's malignant. So we put an endo bag there. So now we're taking it out pretty much belt and suspenders. Not only do we have the alexis, but we have the endo bag. So we're going to make sure that as we take it out, we're not going to have any spillage of you know malignant contents in the rectal cuff. Uh, specimen comes out nice and easy, and uh, I think we're going to see it at the back table. And then we can just kind of end it here because the rest of the steps are, are similar to the other steps where we just do our intracorporeal anastomosis. Thank you very much. Th those are wonderful videos. And for those that may be watching on YouTube, um, you can get the full video on the DCR website, of course. Um, just a few technical questions, if I may. Um, the first question I have is in relation to uh, the air seal. So I know that on one of the videos you describe what ports you place. And, and so is the air seal effectively an essential component of this for hospitals that may not have it in, in terms of losing abdominal domain? Or, or is this an optional bonus for you? No, I think that's a great question. I think you, you absolutely have to have the air seal because you will lose some uh, air with the open rectal cuff. Um, we have some really good video. The air seal creates also a negative pressure. So if you cut the rectum and there's spillage of feces, and if you introduce the proctoscope with that air seal going, all of it comes out like a vacuum. So you like clean out the entire pelvis. So, so you, I would definitely say the air seal is part and partial to, to having a natural orifice, you know, successful surgery. Thank you. Um, I, I found it interesting with the Alexis, I, I didn't appreciate which part of the ring goes into the rectum. And it makes sense, I guess, because there's only one part of the Alexis, which is compressible. Um, how did you settle on the small Alexis versus different sizes? And does the um, Alexis injure the sort of the, the uh, proctotomy? Do you have to ever trim it again? Yeah, so I mean, it's really a team effort like Dr. Lafave, Dr. Ellsworth, Dr. Corsi. I mean, we were, we've been, you know, it's a team approach. We, we kicked it around. We've gone through many different renditions and that seat. We tried the rigid end, but, but the, the bendable end, definitely the, the small is really all you need. Some cases, 20% of cases, we don't use an Alexis at all. It just slides right out. An example, we do a lot of this with endometriosis. We get called in with our GYN and there's a massive, you know, endometriosis in the mid rectum and we just cut, cut, slip it out, do the anastomosis and in the, there, they're like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. So um, you only use the Alexis if you need to, you really only need a small. Uh, so I think it's, it's worked out well. Thank you. How low can you go with this technique? Can you, can you do an ultra low or a coloanal type? Uh, join or, or is it more for sort of yeah. upper rectal or sigmoid? Here's the thing. If, if we're going to do a diverting loop ileostomy, like a low or radiated rectal cancer, we almost always extract the specimen through the ileostomy site. So again, this is pragma pragmatic. We're, we're not here to set any records or do anything that's unreasonable. So a lot of our studies exclude the patients that have radiated chemo, you know, chemo radiation or neoadjuvant treatment. And we keep getting asked, why do you select that out? Because when we know we're going to do an ileostomy, we take it out through the ileostomy site. And then we, we open the fascia a little bit more and then close it after the extraction and do our ileostomy. You can go low. We've done, we have a, another publication in DCR on the new technology section 
of a J pouch that we're doing. So you can't get much lower than that, where we're doing a complete proctectomy. And through the rectum, we're creating our J pouch, just like the fistula video. So you can go, you can go extremely low. Uh, thank you. I really like the practical component of, of your thought process. I'm certainly going to take that on uh, for how I approach things. Um, now, my, my other question is related to sphincter injuries or potential continence or incontinence risk. Is there any data on that or even any anecdotal comments from you? There's, there are a couple of laparoscopic natural, aureus, uh, natural uh, orifice uh, papers that, that talk mainly for some rectal cancer that do speak to not really showing uh, significant injury. We have an IRB that we're in, in the process of, and we're going to do exactly that. We're going we're gonna to study not only the clinical quality of life and, and manometry before and after. Um, this is a really good question. Um, anecdotally, we have not had any long-term issues. There have been a couple of patients that have had some issues in the early post-op phases that have all just resolved. I had a patient that uh, had a bad fissure you know, from time to time. But uh, this is a very important question. We feel it's okay, but I think that needs to be addressed more in a, you know, uh, well thought of trial. Right, uh, thank you. Um, and my last question, I guess, particularly for the patients in Houston that don't subscribe to the cheese eating laws um, and, are, and are bigger, um, what are your approaches to the super obese um, when it comes to these um, approaches? I mean, there's probably no easy answer, but what do you do in general for, for obese patients? I mean, I, th I think we think bigger is better, M meaning for this approach, bigger that you see, and, and we, I think we have uh, uh, a paper out there where we, where we looked at the BMI and the higher BMIs with the NICE procedure acted like the lower BMIs. I think it's an equalizer because if you're doing everything inside and not having to make that extraction incision and all those sort of wound complications, it's an equalizer. And from a robotic point of view, I think that's another equalizer. Um, it, it kind of lowers that difference. Of course, it's a little bit harder. There's no question, but, but it makes things, uh, the outcomes tend to, tend to um, normalize, if you will. So I think when we see the large BMI, 50 and over and stuff like that, even more of a reason, I believe, to avoid and try to do everything intracorporeal. Well, thank you very much um, for that. And thank, thank you to the whole team. Um, I, found, I found this very interesting, certainly learned a, a fair bit. Um, of course, we have recorded this, so this will be on YouTube and then we'll uh, share snippets of it on Twitter in due course. Um, our next meeting is um, next month and, and it's in MD Anderson. Um, so uh, enjoy, enjoy your meal um, and um, it was lovely to meet you. Great. We really appreciate the opportunity and, uh, and hi from Houston. Guys, come down and visit anytime, especially rodeo season. What do you guys think? Yeah. All right. That's where it's at. Have a great night, everyone. Enjoy those Thank onion you. things. <laughs> okay. Waiting for it. Thank <laughs> you.